Hi, welcome to the AVS Forum Get Together. This is Niall from Acoustic Frontiers. Uh, my company, Acoustic Frontiers, helped design and optimize the acoustics for David Beck's The Savoy Theatre. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I'm the founder of Acoustic Frontiers. I'm also an AVS Forum member. I post under my name, Niall Meller. I'm a Home Acoustics Alliance Level 2 Certified Guru. There's only about 25 of us around, so it's a pretty select bunch. Uh, that's the highest home, th home theatre related audio calibration certification there is. Uh, I was born in England, uh, obviously English, and educated at Oxford University. And uh, one interesting thing you probably don't know about me is I also do a bit of part-time mountain bike guiding for a company called Sacred Rides. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, home theatre design. What is it? Why is it important? What should you be doing in terms of home theatre design um, when you're creating your space? Uh, what is acoustic treatment design? You know, again, why is it important? Um, what key things should you be looking at when you design the acoustic treatments for your space? And uh, we'll wrap it up with a case study on the acoustic design of the Savoy Theatre. So what is home theatre design? Home theatre design is comprised of uh, five different elements and these elements are things that affect the end performance of the space, you know, the enjoyment you're going to get from it and the audio and video quality. Uh, there's a home theatre layout, basically where do you put the seats, the screen and the speakers. Uh, low frequency optimization, which is where do you put seats and subwoofers to make a consistent seat to seat bass response. Audio design is specification of the speakers, the subwoofers, amplifiers, signal processing equipment. Uh, video design, the same thing for the screen and the projector. And then finally, acoustic treatment design is the number, type and location of acoustical treatment products. So, so these five elements, they're not everything that you should be thinking about when you're doing a home theater, but they are the core things. Uh, some other things that you should consider would be noise isolation, HVAC, electrical, uh, interior design. Um, those are all you know things that will have some effect on the project, but in my opinion, don't contribute to the end audio video performance. Um, when you're doing home theater design, uh, there are actually a lot more resources than you might think available to you. Um, the, on the left we have some of them printed up for you. The Custom Electronic Design Installation Association have pr uh, produced a number of guidelines on audio, video and HVAC design for home theatres. Home Acoustics Alliance uh, provided a number of acoustic acoustical design, um, design principles. Uh, we've actually developed uh, some design principles ourselves and have published standards for acoustical measurements in a white paper we did with uh, HDA Acoustics. THX, I'm sure you're aware, have done SPL uh, requirements for home theatres. Harman have done a lot of work on low frequency optimization, where to put subs for best performance. And then, you know, AVS Forum does have quite a bit of good information uh, that you can also find, but it shouldn't be your only source. Um, this is obviously like a lot of stuff uh, to really design a home theatre properly, you know, requires a lot of uh, knowledge in all of these five areas. Some of them get pretty specialized, like really the low frequency optimization and the acoustic treatment design. Um, those require some specialist knowledge if you're going to do them to the highest level. And you know, even on the other things like audio and video design, many enthusiasts think they can go at their own, you know, and some of the more sophisticated ones do, but you know, we still see some pretty basic errors from time to time, like using the wrong projector, for example basing the image brightness calculations off a spec sheet lumens output figure rather than a calibrated lumens output figure you know is one classic mistake um, and really by partnering someone like Acoustic Frontiers you can make sure that all these elements are being addressed you know you're following a process to get all of these things optimized and um, all of the guidelines and standards have been factored into your design so uh, uh, most of our work with uh, David Beck's theatre was actually only on the last two elements of uh, 
of this process, the low frequency optimization and the acoustic treatment design. And uh, the low frequency optimization work we did was kind of limited because we didn't have complete freedom in specifying seat and subwoofer locations, as you'll find out later on. So the process for acoustic treatment design uh, has three steps, uh, low frequency analysis, reflection analysis, and uh, reverberation time analysis. Uh, for low frequency analysis, what we're looking for is smooth, consistent, and low resonance bass. You know, this basically is optimizing the seat and subwoofer locations for 100, 100 hertz consistency. Um, like I said, there's very little you can do, or not very little, but it's limited what you can do in terms of acoustic treatment for dealing with sub 100 hertz issues. So really, what you should be aiming for is to place these things properly, place your seats and subwoofers, so that you're minimizing the amount of work you need to do with acoustic treatment. Um, it is possible to use the shell of the room, as in the walls, the ceiling, the floor structure, as uh, to provide bass trapping and absorption. Um, and you know what's left you need to deal with through in-room uh, bass trapping. Obviously again limited what you can do under 100 Hz but certainly the region between 100 and 300 is the main focus for um, in-room bass traps. The second piece is uh, reflection analysis. So what you want to make sure here is that you're controlling and I say controlling not eliminating first reflections you know if you're looking around especially online you'll see a lot of bad advice in my opinion about eliminating fully absorbing all the first reflections and that's the only way you're going to get great sound well you know that's totally in, in my opinion not true um, a lot of research by people like Floyd Toole um, formerly of Harman International have shown that people actually like uh, a certain level of reflections um, it, it improves uh, your perception of um, the sound uh, and your enjoyment of the sound as well. So our process is to analyze the level of the reflection and also the spectral content of that reflection. So what do the frequencies look like, in other words, that are coming off, uh, off that reflective surface. Um, and we do that using a combination of speaker off-axis response information and ray tracing. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail later on. And then using that information, we will appropriately place absorbers and diffusers uh, or combination hybrid products at uh, the first reflection points. Um, the first reflection points are really, uh, you know, only one part of the total sound you hear. The sound in the room is, uh, the sound you hear in a room is a combination of the direct sound, the early reflected or first reflected sound and the late, arrive, uh, late arriving reflections or reverberant sound. Um, so that final piece is the reverberation time analysis. We want to make sure that the mid-range decay times are consistent, you know, everything above about 250 to 8K. We want to make sure it's decaying at the same rate, um, that the room isn't too live, you know, echoey, um, but it's also not too dead. I'm sure many of you have been into home theatres that are too dead. Um, generally not a pleasant place to be and, and we do that through RT60 modeling um, and then what that informs is really how do you uh, treat the rest of the room so you know do you use carpet everywhere uh, what kind of fabric do you use if you're doing a stretch um, that kind of stuff so really the message here is acoustic treatment design is a process you know So let's shift gears a bit. We're going to talk about uh, David Beck's theater now, you know, the one you're hopefully sitting in. Um, the first piece is the low frequency optimization. So what we did here was do some simulations of um, the sound pressure level at uh, six different uh, locations. So basically this corresponds to the front row. Uh, you can see this X here, X 4.27 meters. Uh, and the second row, x 6.25 meters. Um, those are the first and second rows. And uh, you can see they're plotted on the chart here in terms of the expected frequency response. Um, so what we're aiming for is for all the lines to be very close together. And if that happens, it means that the response is consistent. 
if the response is consistent it means we can equalize effectively um, these uh, simulations you'll notice on the left hand side the scale is kind of scary you know 50 to 120 decibels that's like a huge range of uh, huge range of SPLs but this simulation work we do um, doesn't really take into account uh, any absorptive effects of the room um, we do do some uh, allowances for shell uh, absorption and the effects of that um, but really um, don't try and make it overly complicated because really the thing we're looking at here is the seat to seat consistency not necessarily what the shape of the graph is going to look like at the end of the day um, you can see in this room uh, well we only had really two subs available to us David gave us said you know hey you've got two subs to play with two LFE subs um, so the number of locations we could put these is is limited as well because uh, we could only put them essentially across the stage at the front of the room um, or, or in one particular central location in the back wall which is this kind of cubby hole area we'll talk about a bit later um, so we ended up with a two sub 25 75 percent of room width strategy and you can see uh, above about 55 hertz it's actually very good uh, in terms of the upper base performance but below that the performance from seat to seat uh, especially between the front row and the back row is variable you'll see that the placement strategy has made the response on each row very consistent like these are the three seats on the front row and these are three seats across the back row um, but the diff there is a difference between you know row one and row two um, we optimized in this case for the front row you know so if you look at this the shape of this curve there isn't really any major dips in it and so we could take out this peak here with equalization um, and that would give a nice response in the front row the takeaway for you guys is if you're doing a multi-row home theater you need more subs than just two for consistent base i mean four is probably a minimum so let's look at how we implemented some acoustic treatment in david beck's uh, theater uh, for low frequency bass trapping what we did was we did uh, design and build a couple of uh, dedicated full bandwidth you know things that are going to be absorptive down to 40 or 50 30 hertz bass traps uh, a couple in the front room corners uh, which are behind the stage that you won't see um, so if, if you see this location here behind kind of the corner of the stage there's two really big bass traps one in each corner um, and then we also did one on the back wall uh, which is just around the subwoofer those traps are um, spaced uh, fiberglass absorbers so fiberglass absorbers with a large air gap um, but the other thing we did as well is all of the treatments we specified for reflection point control uh, on the ceiling here these are the reflection point control for the LCR speakers and then also the reflection point control on the side walls here um, and these diffusers you see up here those all actually function as uh, base traps as well um, because they have effectiveness down to about 100 cycles, 100 hertz. Um, the products on the ceiling, uh, four inch absorptive panels, uh, these on the side walls are actually made of ultra touch insulation, which has a higher gas flow resistivity, um, as in it's a better absorber than fiberglass. It's also much nicer to work with, and that's why we specified that on the side walls. And then these diffusers, uh, these are actually OLX products, they are hollow in the back and that hollow uh, nature of the diffusers actually turns them into um, a kind of panel uh, absorber. So they're absorptive in the 100 to 300 hertz range, obviously not absorptive uh, outside that above that because they're hard, hard surface, but they create a nice um, absorption boost most, most where it's needed, which is that room mode region. You know below 300 Hertz in terms of the reflection points so we're moving on really now into the second step of the acoustic design process uh, we looked at the off-axis response of the JTR speakers this is the lateral off-axis uh, this is the vertical off-axis um, we did uh, ray tracing so basically looking at where the reflection points would fall 
for each seat location and each speaker uh, on the sidewalls. And then we also did a bunch of calculations involving uh, what the cancellation frequencies are, what the level of the direct versus reflected SPL is, uh, what the delay is, uh, what kind of um, SPL we would expect back at what time from the reflection. And the reason all that's important is because how you hear the reflection depends on you know, three things, what level it is, uh, what the spectral content of that reflection is relative to the direct sound, and what the delay is relative to the direct sound. And our process takes into account all of those things. Uh, I don't think there are that many other people or companies doing um, as sophisticated as analysis on the reflection points. And it's something, you know, we've developed in house really. Um, the takeaway for you guys is that please, please, please do not just use the generic absorbers at first reflection points approach. You know, that's what you're going to get from the less sophisticated designers out there and from you know generic acoustic treatment companies uh, maybe even some of the internet direct acoustic treatment companies they're not going to take any measurements of the speakers they're not going to do any of this kind of reflection uh, analysis they're just going to take a look at the photos you guys have provided maybe a room sketch and then you know recommend hey two of product a three of product b and that's your reflection point control um, if you want a, a sound that's balanced in terms of imaging versus spaciousness uh, and you want something that's going to you know, give you the highest quality from acoustic treatment, then that's totally the wrong approach. Uh, you need to look at it uh, at a more sophisticated level. So let's look at how this theory translates into practice. We're looking at the, this photo is looking at the left side wall in the Savoy Theatre. You can see there's a bunch of acoustic treatments. They're all hidden behind the fabric now. Uh, let me just talk you through what we have. We have uh, these slat diffusers. These are actually hybrid products. They have good absorption down to about 100 hertz that's afforded by the ultra touch insulation, this cotton insulation we have behind the slats. Uh, they're also diffusers because of the spacing between the open areas and the closed areas. Uh, they're actually a different type of diffusion design than the traditional QRD type that you'll see up here. Um, they're also two different designs. If you look, this one has a different set of spacings than this one. Uh, this one has more open area because the reflections coming off it would otherwise be higher in level than this one because the seats are closer to this back area than to the front area. So um, the reflections off here have more of a chance to die down in SPL level compared to the reflections from here. And that's why we want a bit more absorption here to reduce the level of the reflections. Uh, these products up here um, are all diffusers, different types of diffusers and purposely specified in particular locations as well. Um, there's often a double bounce reflection that comes off the upper part of the ceiling, uh, sorry, the upper part of the wall, and then the ceiling, and then to your ears. Uh, most people miss this, um, but it's actually one that you can spot if you're looking at you know, the levels of reflections doing some acoustic measurements. And so wherever possible in our designs, we try and specify in some either absorption or diffusion in these locations. Uh, when we were doing the modeling for David's room, uh, you know, we we thought the diffusion would be the best way to go. Um, we've used different products here because these products at the front are more aggressive diffusers and they need a bit more space between you and the diffusers um, for them to sound nice. Whereas these are quite gentle and these are very gentle diffusers. And basically, you know, gentle is a way of saying that the more gentle the diffusion properties are, the closer you can sit to it without hearing weird stuff. You know, uh, sometimes people complain that these aggressive QRD type diffusers like these, um, they can sound a bit phasey if you sit close to them, which is why we have this kind of arrangement here. Uh, the other thing these diffusers do is actually provide some bass absorption, um, like I talked about earlier. Final thing we did for David was baffle wall design. 
Uh, baffle wall is something that you do in addition to those five uh, core pieces of home theater design we talked about earlier. Baffle wall does a couple of things for you. One is it provides an optimal radiation environment for your speakers. Second thing it will do is hold the speakers in the correct location relative to the screen. You can design your baffle wall to support the screen as well as the speakers. In this case, there's a separate screen wall structure in front of the baffle wall. Uh, so we didn't do that here, but you can. Uh, the particular baffle wall we designed for David is very strong, non-resonant. It's comprised of three layers of material on the front with uh, an additional layer of high density foam and then a layer of uh, uh, this ridge cosmetic foam you see on the front. Um, it has some slots in it, so the slots you can see either side of the center speaker and also holes uh, or cutouts in the corners. So these allow the base energy to go propagate behind the baffle wall and provide some absorption which you don't get with the continuous left to right baffle wall. Uh, you can see some more details of how these hanging panels were constructed in that photo on the right hand side. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Again, I'm Niall Meller from Acoustic Frontiers. We really specialize in home theater design and acoustics. If you need any help with our stuff, thinking about doing your own project, please get in touch. Uh, you can reach us on the web, www.acousticfrontiers.com and my personal email address, niall at acousticfrontiers.com or we have our office number there on the page also. Thank you.